Did you know that Nintendo canceled the Zelda game between Link's Awakening and Ocarina of Time so they could make Star Fox 64 instead? We've covered quite a few lost Zelda games over the years, but today we're going to take extra deep dives into three of them. Zelda Super FX, Zelda Treasure Tracker, and Ura Zelda. We worked with some data miners, translated old magazine interviews from around the world, and even talked to a couple guys who worked on those games, all to dig up some new info that you definitely haven't heard before. So let's get into it. Starting with the follow-up to Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, that was planned as the series' first footsteps into the third dimension. The game was being developed for the Super Famicom, that's the Japanese version of the Super Nintendo, around 1994. And just like Star Fox, the cartridge would have had a Super FX chip inside. Those chips were fully capable of rendering 3D polygons and would have made Zelda one of the most powerful games on the console. Maybe the most powerful. Not only that, but Nintendo also put some of their top developers on the project. Zelda Super FX has been shrouded in mystery for decades, but thanks to some leaks and new translations, we've got some early Link models, animations, and some information never available in English before. In a 1995 issue of Edge magazine, Miyamoto said they were going to release a lot of Super FX games over the coming year, but only four of them ended up making it to store shelves. Several more were in development, but ultimately got canceled, the most famous of which was Star Fox 2. It was 100% complete, but Nintendo threw it in the trash because they were afraid it was going to look like trash compared to games already coming out on the PlayStation, with them specifically citing Ridge Racer. Side-by-side -side comparisons would have made Nintendo look weak and behind the times, so they decided to slow their roll with 3D until the Nintendo 64 launched a year later. We heard that there was a Zelda title that met the same fate, and some details could be found in the official Japanese strategy guide for Star Fox 64. So we bought a copy from Japan and had it translated. Inside there was a six-page interview where Miyamoto and a few other devs reveal not only the cancelled game's existence, but also that Takayo Shimizu, Kazuaki Morita, and Takaya Imamura were all working on it. For folks unfamiliar with these guys, well basically they're all Nintendo OGs. Just to name some of their highlights, Shimizu was Star Fox 64's director and also directed BS Zelda, the Zelda 1 remake only released in Japan. Morita programmed the original Adventure of Link and was the main programmer on Ocarina of Time. And Imamura was art director on Majora's Mask as well as the creator of Star Fox, Captain Falcon, and Tingle. In the interview translation, Shimizu says, Actually, the three of us were working on a Super Famicom version of Adventure of Link. But then the 64 wave came and I told Miyamoto that it would take two years to make this Link game. He asked me what the heck I was talking about. Miyamoto chimes in and says, I was quite shocked. The interviewer asks, so this was some time ago? Miyamoto replies, yeah, back when there were still tyrannosaurs roaming Japan. Just kidding. Jokes aside though, yeah, we started Star Fox 64 a year before the N64 came out. All of these guys went on to have prominent roles in Star Fox 64's development, so it sounds like Link died so Fox could fly. Simply put, Zelda got cancelled because it would have arrived too late in the Super Famicom's life cycle, about a year after the Nintendo 64 was already on the market. That's why it got cancelled. But what kind of game would it have been? Even in Japan, not much else was known until 2011. That's when Yoshiaki Kazumi revealed he was part of the team as well and dropped a few more details. He said, I really like Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, before Super Mario 64. I had actually been making Adventure of Link in polygons with Miyamoto. When asked if he meant for Super Famicom, Koizumi said yes, we were experimenting with a thin polygon Link seen from the side and fighting with his sword. Chanbara was a pending issue at the time. We couldn't really bring Adventure of Link into form at that time, but I kept that desire to achieve a sword fighting Legend of Zelda game until I joined the Ocarina of Time team. Chanbara here basically means exaggerated samurai style sword fighting. The original Adventure of Link introduced the down thrust, up thrust, and a few other moves, but combat was still pretty basic. Ocarina's combat was very much influenced by Chanbara, and would have been interesting to see how they would have implemented it into Zelda Super FX. Koyazumi was scriptwriter for Link's Awakening, so with him and those three other rock stars on the job and Miyamoto overseeing it, Adventure of Link had all the ingredients to become something special. A lot of fans consider the original Adventure of Link the black sheep of the franchise, and Miyamoto appears to think so too. In 2013, Miyamoto was asked if he'd ever made a bad game, and he said, I wouldn't say that I've ever made a bad game per se, but a game I think we could have done more with was Zelda 2: The Adventure of Link. When we're designing games, we have our plan for what we're going to design, but in our process it evolves and grows from there. In Zelda 2: The Adventure of Link, unfortunately all we ended up creating was what we originally had on paper. Now almost a decade later, with a dream team, more powerful hardware, 
and some new ideas, it seems Miyamoto was aiming to fix what they had failed to do the first time. But unfortunately, they waited too long to start making it. And by 1995, the PlayStation was making the super effects look like cave drawings. In the two interviews where the game gets mentioned, the devs call it Adventure of Link for Super Famicom. Some Japanese fan wikis classify it as a sequel to the original Famicom game, but the primary sources don't specify if it was actually a sequel or more of a remake. We spoke briefly to one of the game's developers, but he'd only confirmed that he had worked on it and refused to define if it was either a remake or a sequel. Nintendo doesn't like squealers, unfortunately. And they had never released a single screenshot of the game. But in 2020, the GigaLeak revealed what appeared to be early Link models from the abandoned project. They were found in a file called the Koizumi and dated July 27, 1994, which implies Nintendo worked on the game for about a year before scrapping it to begin work on Star Fox 64. The models were discovered by a modder named Starkson, who already had tons of experience with the Super FX after reverse engineering Star Fox years before. What you're seeing now is Link imported into the Star Fox engine, because they use the same model format and the same standard color palette. We got in touch with Starkson and asked if he thinks that these models are from the long lost adventure of Link. He said, they are very early experiments. They surely have something to do with what Koizumi was describing in that Awada interview, but they seem to be very, very early in the process. Starkson's a bit of an expert on the Super FX chip, so we asked if it was capable of more complex models that could have looked, you know, uh, better, or if this was as lifelike as it was going to get. He said with enemies, obstacles, and scenery, they couldn't have made models much more detailed than what you're seeing now. Although it's worth noting, Link probably would have been a different color in the final game, and also would have been a lot smaller and surrounded by the game world. So he wouldn't have come across as quite so blocky. After all, if you look at pretty much anything from that era close enough, it all looks like lifeless squares. Starkson also told us that as far as he knows, no one's found any other assets in the Giga Leak, like items, locations, or other character models. But that said, the leak contained tens of thousands of files, so maybe there's more in there that data miners haven't found yet. It's possible that someday they'll dig up the right file and discover a half-built Hyrule. So until more information is either revealed by Nintendo or found in a leak, what we've shared in this video is everything there is to know since the game's cancellation 25 years ago. While we were searching the internet for more details, we stumbled over a Japanese fan site that engaged in an interesting thought experiment, and we'll close out this segment by sharing their thoughts on what they call The Adventure of Link 2, the unfinished fifth Zelda game. They write, It seems development ended halfway through due to timing issues, but one wonders what kind of game it would have been if development continued. After it released, maybe the franchise would have split into two, a sub-series for 3D and a sub-series for side-scrolling Zeldas, like what happened to the Mario franchise. If this project was released to the world, perhaps the history of Zelda would have been different. Whether that timeline was better or worse than the one we're currently living in, we'll leave that up to you to decide. Next up is a Zelda diorama game pitched internally at Nintendo around 2012. The short version of the story is that Captain Toad Treasure Tracker was originally pitched as a Zelda game. It got good review scores when it launched, but it probably would have been more interesting and sold better if it starred Link instead of Toad. Unfortunately though, Miyamoto said it couldn't be a Zelda game. Then the pitch was literally set on fire and destroyed. But let's get into the long version of the story, which features three main characters. Koichi Hayashida, the director and producer of 3D Mario games, Shinya Hirotake, a Mario level designer, and of course, Shigeru Miyamoto. After wrapping up development on Super Mario 3D Land, the team started exploring ideas for a new Wii U game. Fans complained about how the camera worked in early 3D Mario, so Galaxy and 3D Land ditched the player-controlled camera in favor for a camera that controlled itself. Wanting to try something new on the Wii U, the devs experimented with a new type of Mario game where every stage was a standalone miniature world, a diorama, and spinning it around with the camera was one of the core mechanics. But they ended up deciding it wasn't a good format for Mario, and they wanted to make a Zelda game out of it instead. According to Hayashida, when we started working on Super Mario 3D World, we created a number of tests, one of which was a stage where you look in from the outside, a little diorama stage using Mario. The thing we noticed was that if Mario could jump, the stages become pretty big, so we wondered whether it would be possible to make a game with a character who can't jump. Hirotake submitted an idea to Mr. Miyamoto, the father of both Super Mario and Zelda, to use Link as the character. We wanted to make this into its own game, separate from 3D World. In a Japanese interview we translated, Hirotake says he built a little diorama out of paper mache, a tiny little Zelda world. In another interview he said, we always wanted to think about how we can introduce more 3D games to people. So we wanted to build a sandbox, a small contained world that has a linear path. When we were thinking about which characters don't jump, we thought of Link from The Legend of Zelda. 
Miyamoto. After some preparation, Hirotake took his paper mache diorama and pitched it to Miyamoto and a few other executives. He spun it around, imitating the camera mechanic. Miyamoto liked it, but he was sort of confused. He thought Hirotake wanted to manufacture physical dioramas and sell them as toys, kind of like Lego sets. When Hirotake said, no, I want to make a Zelda video game, Miyamoto soured and told him no. But he would let them use it as a minigame in Super Mario 3D World. That's when Link got swapped out for Captain Toad, who, the devs reasoned, also can't jump because he wears a heavy backpack. After 3D World was finished, Miyamoto liked the six Captain Toad stages so much that he said, you know what, actually, I think it would be a good idea to make this into its own game. One year later, that game released as Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. According to Hayashida, the game's first boss being a dragon was actually a leftover from when they were thinking it'd be a Zelda title. This may be why it bears some resemblance to Valu from Wind Waker's first boss fight. A few other ideas appear to be leftovers as well, like collecting keys and unlocking doors, something you don't see much of in Mario games. Almost all of Treasure Tracker's 70-plus dioramas are tributes to some slice of the overall Mario franchise, like this one, themed after the original 1981 Donkey Kong arcade game. A few more are reminiscent of the series' green grass, desert ice, and fire levels. And there are also some nods to the series' spin-offs, like this homage to Luigi's Mansion. If Treasure Tracker stayed part of the Zelda IP, we likely would have gotten dioramas based on Zelda 1, A Link to the Past, Coherent Island, Kakariko Village, Termina, The Great Sea, and so on. Besides the Dragon Boss, a few other Captain Toad levels are already feel like they'd be at home in Zelda Treasure Tracker. This train stage could have easily been themed after Spirit Tracks, and this stealth stage feels pretty similar to the stealth sequence in Ocarina of Time's Castle Courtyard. None of that's too far-fetched, it's just unfortunate that the original pitch went the way it did. In that Japanese interview, Hayashida says, if Hirotake had given a better presentation, there's a chance it would have been a different game with Zelda instead. Then the interviewer asked Hirotake what ended up happening to that paper mache Zelda diorama. I burned it, he said. It was such a bad memory that I decided to let it die. With an average review score of 82%, Captain Toad was a solid game, but unfortunately its protagonist just didn't have the star power of Mario or Link, so most people never gave it a chance. Even after it was ported to the Switch, Treasure Tracker never managed to sell well. It even reviewed better than many Zelda spin-offs and remakes, but sold far less, so maybe things would have been different if it starred Link. And maybe Miyamoto turning down Hiratake's original pitch wasn't the best business decision. Treasure Tracker is almost a decade old at this point, without a sequel in sight, so apparently Nintendo didn't think it sold too well either, at least not well enough to become its own side series. There is a silver lining to this story, though. It seems Hirotake's pitch may have had an impact in a way he never could have expected. In 2019, Nintendo announced a Switch remake of Link's Awakening, with a new art direction that series producer Eiji Anuma called a miniature diorama style, with Link modeled after a 10 centimeter figure. They even built some real-life dioramas of Kohelent Island and showed them off at E3. The devs never explicitly stated the new look was inspired by Hirotake's pitch, but considering the proximity of events and the unique art style, it seems unlikely to have all just been a coincidence. And now on to the next game we're going to talk about, Ura Zelda, a disc drive expansion to Ocarina of Time that met a similar fate as Zelda Super FX. Ura Zelda has been covered by countless other YouTube channels already, but a lot of them are filled with rumors and half-truths. We managed to dig up some new information on what was real and what wasn't. So we figured, what the hell, there's probably room on YouTube for at least one more video. For the past two decades, there have been two schools of thought. The fans with a wildly overinflated idea of what Ura Zelda really was, like that Zora's domain was going to get unfrozen, and Link could finally outrace the Running Man, and the opposite side of the spectrum. The fans who insist it was never going to be anything more than the Master Quest, the GameCube bonus disc that was just Ocarina of Time with remixed dungeons and increased difficulty. But really, the truth is somewhere in the middle. At a Q&A session around the time Ocarina's development was wrapping up, someone asked Miyamoto, will there be a 64DD Zelda or an add-on for Ocarina of Time? He said, I don't know if add-on is the right terminology. For the 64DD, we are working on a Zelda game, which we call Ura Zelda, where you first play Ocarina of Time. After finishing everything, you can enter into the world, into the basic design of the same. The basic design of the same. Pretty vague, right? Possibly poor translation work from 1990s American press, but even if that's the case with this particular quote, it's fair to say Miyamoto used a lot of vague language to describe what Ura Zelda was going to be throughout its entire development. He did occasionally drop some solid details though, but unfortunately, not usually in English. At this point in our research, we had to dig through a few thousand old gaming magazines from around the world to find all the Ura Zelda interviews. So let's work our way through them. Then, onto some data mining. 
The week Ocarina hit store shelves, Miyamoto told Next Gen Magazine, Ocarina of Time was designed with the introduction of the DD in mind, and if you load the game with the drive connected to your system, you will see a different title screen option, which says Ura Zelda, another version of Zelda. This was actually a mistranslation from Next Generation. I've got my copy of Ocarina and a 64 DD right here next to me. This is what you'd see. It doesn't actually say Ura Zelda, it just says disc. When you boot up the cartridge with the DD attached, the game will just boot per usual. However, we can trick the game into thinking Ura is present with a custom disc or software emulation. Every Ocarina cartridge was manufactured with the expectation that Ura Zelda was already on the way and millions of players were going to connect it to their Ocarina carts. It never happened, obviously, but we'll get into that later. In that same interview, Miyamoto goes on to say, There were several ideas I could not incorporate into Zelda because of the lack of time and various other factors. For example, I wanted to create some extra dungeons and challenges for those who had completed the quest, and we planned them for the predicted introduction of the DD. One feature in particular that Miyamoto wanted to do in Ocarina, but couldn't, was connectivity features with the Game Boy. Talking to Japanese magazine 64 Dream, he said Majora's Mask would not let players create custom masks, but hinted they might be able to do so in Ura Zelda, by using the Game Boy camera together with Mario Artist. At the time, Nintendo was already experimenting with a similar feature from Mother 3, another disk drive game that never saw the light of day. But we weren't sure if that stuff actually got worked on, or if it was just an early idea Miyamoto threw out there willy-nilly in a couple of interviews. Lucky for us, us, tons of N64 development assets dropped in the 2020 Giga Leak. We wanted to dig through them and check for mask customization in Ura Zelda, but frankly, it's a lot more complicated than we're equipped to handle. So we talked to Luigi Blood, an Ocarina of Time modder and 64DD enthusiast who'd already spent countless hours digging through all that leaked data. We'll try not to use too much technical jargon, but basically he told us that Ocarina's assets showed it was compatible with Mario Artist, just like Miyamoto talked about. That compatibility was removed from Ocarina's retail release, but Luigi Blood noted, they also mess with masks during Ura Zelda development. There are traces where they seemingly wanted to do something with the Gerudo mask and Keaton mask. Unfortunately, I don't know what for, as the disk source code is not present in the GigaLeak. Only the base information and make files. All I can see is that the disk side code keeps track of the model file location, possibly to replace the mask files. In other words, new mask stuff in Ura Zelda was indeed more than just empty chatter. Nintendo was actually making it at one point. Another interesting feature Miyamoto talked about was an online component. In the August 98 issue of Nintendo Power, having just finished making Ocarina, Miyamoto said, We've already talked about a network Zelda as an interesting idea. The assistance of other players in the network could motivate a player's active participation instead of the traps or secrets that I create. And the 64DD was fully capable of accessing the internet. In fact, most people who bought it paid 2,500 yen a month for an online subscription. But again, we weren't sure if those network features actually got worked on. We checked with Luigi Blood, but he said there weren't any traces in the Giga Leak. But the leak was incomplete and missing lots of data, so network features not being in there didn't necessarily mean they weren't in development. Fortunately, Miyamoto wasn't alone in that Nintendo Power interview. There were three other Zelda developers, one of them being a very young Giles Goddard. Giles was the first non-Japanese programmer to ever work for Nintendo, basically because Nintendo couldn't find anyone in Japan who could match his whiz kid programming skills. Giles worked on Star Fox, which was revolutionary for achieving 3D in the 16-bit era, and he also made the stretchy face for Super Mario 64. More importantly, though, he worked on Zelda. Giles left Nintendo in 2002, and now he lives on a small, idyllic Japanese island running his own studio and making games like Curse to Golf. We tracked him down to ask some questions about the old days. We talked for half an hour about various projects, and toward the end, we read him the quote from his interview with Miyamoto in 1998. Here's his response. Do you recall any specifics regarding work on this network Zelda that have never, been, that have never made their way into a finished Zelda game? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I want to stay alive, so I'm not going to say what. Giles wasn't willing to share any details beyond the fact that they did work on those network features that were never made public, and that they were, and still are, top secret. But just knowing Network Zelda was more than empty chatter was interesting in itself. Miyamoto saying players would replace his traps and secrets kind of sounds like a dungeon builder, where you could design your own dungeons and share them online. We went looking for evidence, but eventually realized that wasn't the correct interpretation when we found a German magazine where Miyamoto specifically said no, there won't be a dungeon builder. Interestingly though, he does describe a different 
different dungeon system than the static remixes that made their way into Master Quest. Instead of simply remixing dungeons, he said they were going to be randomized. The Germans asked what'll make Ura different from Ocarina, and Miyamoto said simply put there will be a random element. Every time you go into a dungeon, the composition will be different. For example, if a treasure chest was in a certain place the first time you entered the dungeon, it won't be there the next time, but will be in a completely different location. Then he says there won't be a dungeon builder or something like an online versus mode. But because of the 64DD's read and write capabilities, they're thinking about new downloadable dungeons and sharing other data with players. That seems to line up with what he told a Mexican magazine a couple months later, that there's a potential for hundreds of dungeons. Both of these interviews were in late 1999 though. By then, it seems Miyamoto had already given up on adding new features outside of Hyrule's dungeons. That's because at that point, Ura Zelda had already been neutered in favor of Majora's Mask due to Eiji Anuma thinking Ura wouldn't make a worthy sequel. Talking to Nintendo president Satoru Iwata, he said Miyamoto felt like there was still a lot left to do and wanted to make new ways to play and a new story. But as Ocarina's dungeon director, Aonuma just couldn't get excited about making new ones for Ura. So Miyamoto offered a compromise. Instead of using Ocarina's assets to make a flip side game, if they could use those assets to make an entirely new game in one year, then Aonuma wouldn't have to work on Ura Zelda. Aonuma took the deal. Then he and most of the Ocarina team broke off to work on Majora's Mask, leaving a much smaller team left to work on Ura. Even Miyamoto, originally the driving force behind the expansion, abandoned it to focus its attention exclusively on Majora's Mask. With most of its resources stripped, all of those earlier ideas about custom masks, network features, and new story elements fell by the wayside. And that's how Ura Zelda became Master Quest. Instead of an ambitious expansion, it was downgraded to a second quest with remixed dungeons. In a few interviews, Miyamoto teased the idea of releasing Ocarina with remixed dungeons as a $20 N64 cartridge. But by the time Ura's development wrapped up in June of 2000, the GameCube was right around the corner, so they threw it in as a Wind Waker pre-order incentive and the rest is history. Well, not really though. It's one of the most legendary cancelled games of all time, so history never really ends and the rumors just keep on coming. So we need to debunk some new rumors that came out of the 2020 Giga Leak. You might have heard news that 64DD files were discovered for nine mini dungeons, which were intended as a sort of boss rush mode that got cut during Ura's development. Here's the first one, which is only two rooms based on the Deku Tree. A modder named Zell was kind enough to reconstruct all nine mini dungeons for us. Here's the footage of what it looks like to actually play them. You fight a few enemies, get some treasure, then fight a boss. Most of them are a little bigger, like the Spirit Temple mini dungeon. When they were discovered in the Giga Leak, since they were 64DD files, a lot of fans thought that they were an Ura Zelda boss rush, and that's what got reported by various websites and YouTubers. A new mode would have been awesome, and really helped make Ura feel like a true expansion to Ocarina, but unfortunately, the reality isn't quite as exciting. These mini dungeons were actually developed before Ocarina was finished, and they appear to just be placeholders for testing out the 64DD's hooks. Hooks are basically just the things that let the game replace one thing for another. In this case, swapping out dungeons. Luigi Blood spent a long time cataloging all of the hooks, and he told us, when they made the retail version of Ocarina of Time, they had to have a base disc expansion for testing, because it would have been bad if the game came out with a bad disc expansion code within. The only hooks I've seen are for rooms, scenes, dungeon mini-maps, dungeon maps for the pause menu, text, scene processing, and ROM loading. Although, you can technically replace almost anything except sound and music, including NPCs and NPC code, for example. But, the 64 DD hook system felt badly planned for new features. Not impossible to implement new features, but oddly more complicated than it could have been designed. Miyamoto did say he wanted to expand on Hyrule's NPCs, but it seems that ambition was ultimately pursued in Majora's Mask rather than in Ura. Speaking of which, early versions of the Swamp Spider House and Beneath the Well were also found in Ura's leaked files, which led to more rumors that they were originally created for Ura, but got repurposed for Majora's Mask. But those files were added to Ura in May 2000, after Majora had already released in Japan, so it seems they were also just for testing purposes and never actually meant for inclusion in Ura Zelda. This was a pretty complicated section, so here's the general takeaway. Nintendo designed the hooks to be capable of much more than just remixed dungeons. So some features were actually in development and discussed publicly by Miyamoto after he had already finished making Ocarina, like mask customization and online connectivity. In that sense, you could say Ura Zelda really was more than Master Quest. But a lot of the rumors and fan expectations of what Ura Zelda should have been, like unfreezing Zoro's domain and outracing the Running Man, were just fake. They were never promised by Nintendo, and there's no evidence they were ever in development. And as a side note, while we're talking about the Running Man, during our research we actually found out why you can't beat him in Ocarina. And that's probably a good way to end today's video. In the April 99 issue of Nintendo Dream Magazine, the interviewer asks point blank, why can't you outrace the Running Man? Ocarina's map data manager, Shigeo Kimura, takes the question and explains, quote, 
The Running Man seems like someone you can beat, but you can't. That effectively makes him Link's greatest rival in Hyrule. In a way, he's even more powerful than Ganon. But really, the reason's because we didn't have anything to give the player as a reward for beating him. So there's your answer to the great mystery. The devs don't let you beat him because they didn't have anything special to give you. I guess they didn't want to give us another huge rupee. Did you also know that there are several games in the Legend of Zelda series that never got a release in the USA? If you want to see them all in one place, check out the video on screen. And a big thanks to everyone who helped make this video possible. Those were three Lost Zelda games, but we would love to cover more if there's demand, so leave a like and a comment and subscribe if you want more. I'm Tony from Hard for Games, and be sure to check out my channel where I explore those mini 64DD test dungeons in depth. Thanks for watching.